The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. This evening, the DuPont Cavalcade brings you the story of a man whose name has become a symbol of authority in every home, office, and classroom in America, the schoolmaster to a nation, Noah Webster. We also have an announcement that will be of unusual interest to a number of our listeners. Many people who enjoy hearing the brief stories of chemistry told at the close of our broadcasts each week have asked for more information about these modern achievements of science. A 32-page booklet illustrated in color called Chemistry and You may be secured free of charge by writing DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware. We'll tell you more about it at the end of the program. We're sure you will want to send for this fascinating account of how chemical research works to produce, as DuPont expresses it, better things for better living through chemistry. As an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play They Didn't Believe Me. DuPont Cavalcade moves forward. <laughs> Noah Webster, America's first great lexicographer, was born in West Hartford, Connecticut, October 16, 1758. As a boy, he was very studious. When he was graduated from Yale in 1778, in his 20th year, 
He went back to his home. One day, his father and mother are in the family living room talking. Let the boy alone, I tell you. He knows what he wants to do, and it's not our right to disturb him. But, Father, he's been in his room for three days. He won't even come to the door. Must be something very serious to keep a boy from speaking to his mother. It is serious. Uh, I suppose I may as well tell you, Mercy. You'll give me no rest until I do. I've told the boy the truth. He knows how poor we really are. Oh, you shouldn't have told him. I thought it was his right to know. We've given up much for him, Mercy, and done it willingly. But the time has come when he must manage for himself. He's still so young. He's a man now, Mercy. He must take up the burden. You aren't going to send him away. Well, he must decide that. Noah has had his share. We have Charles to think of now. I suppose so. What did you tell him? I told him that we had mortgaged the farm to give him his education. Oh, Father, that was cruel. Did you have to do that? He had to know sometime. I told him he would have to make his own living. I had done all I could. So that's why he's locked himself in his room. You've broken his heart. But, Mercy, we have other children. We must be just. I'm going to knock on his door again. Perhaps he'll answer me. He's eaten nothing. He's breathing himself to death. Uh, quiet, quiet, Mercy. Here he comes now. Noah, my dear, I've been so worried about you. Will you eat something now? Presently, Mother. Oh, you mustn't be hurt. You mustn't grieve. I'm not grieving. Noah, your father's told me. I know why you've been locked in your room. You think I've been sulking? I think his news has overwhelmed you, dear. Well, I'm not overwhelmed, Mother. I've been blind not to realize the circumstances sooner. But why have you shut yourself away? I... I've been fortifying myself. Thinking. Fortifying yourself? Father, there's one thing I want most in all the world. I've thought about it for three days in there. It seems impossible, but my mind's made up. I'm determined to study law. But that calls for money. Where will you get it? I have a plan that I'm sure is right, Father. First, I'm going to be a schoolmaster. I can teach in the daytime and study law at night. It'll be a bargain. This country needs education, and I'll provide it in exchange for my own. But you can't earn enough teaching here in Hartford in this little school. Well, then I'll teach in a larger one, and larger and larger, till I accomplish what I want. I admire your spirit, boy, but... Teaching's the one thing I know, Father. The one way out of all this. After several years of combined teaching and studying, in which he not only mastered law, but French, Spanish, and Italian, Noah Webster moved to Sharon, Connecticut, and established his own academy. There he became a member of young Miss Juliana Smith's literary society and conducted singing school in the evenings. And there he fell in love with Rebecca Pardee. The singing school is holding its weekly session. But it would hurt his feelings, and he's so kindly. Well, he may be kindly, but he's surely tired. Why, Juliana, how can you speak that way? Why, even your father says that he's bound to make his mark, that he's a painstaking man and a thorough student. Oh, he's all of that, but I find him deadly dull. Well, I don't. Oh, Rebecca, I think he's fascinating. I like him. Oh, Rebecca, I... and I never even suspected it. <laughs> Why, you're blushing. Oh, Juliana, I'm sorry, but I've just got to talk to someone. I'm... I'm in the most awful predicament. I don't understand. Oh, Juliana, the major has come home on leave. Oh, how thrilling. Rebecca, are you going to marry him? Well, that's the trouble. I I don't know. Don't know why I thought... Well, you thought I was walking out with him before he went away. Well, I was. 
And I liked him a great deal. We had, well, practically an understanding. Now that he's home. Now that he's home, he wants a definite answer to his offer of marriage. Well, you are going to take him, aren't you? Oh, Juliana, don't you see? That's the trouble. I... I've had an offer of marriage from Noel Webster, too. Oh, and what does the Major say about that? Well, the Major doesn't know. And Papa says I must choose between them at once. He prefers Noah, but he thinks that I'm bound to the Major. Mama prefers the Major. Well, Rebecca, what are you going to do? Well, you know as well as I do. In such situations, the custom has always been to put the decision up to the elders of the church. And Papa has taken the matter to the elders, Juliana. And I imagine you're hoping they decide you can marry Noah Webster, even though you've had an understanding with the Major. When will you know? Any moment now. Papa's coming over to tell me. Rebecca. Uh Aha. I've been looking all over for you. May I have the honor of escorting you home when singing school's over? Why, oh, excuse me, Mr. Webster. I know you and Rebecca have matters of importance to discuss. What? Is anything wrong, Rebecca? Nothing, no, except... You're pale. Are you ill? Not ill, really. Noah, I've something to tell you. Something favorable, I hope. Noah, I... I haven't been able to make up my mind. You can't choose between us. I... I like you both, Noah. But in a way, I'm bound to the major. Oh, Rebecca. You see, before he left, I had an understanding with him. Before I met you. So the custom is, in such situations, to have the elders settle the issue. And I must accept their decision. But whatever they decide, I want you to know one thing, Noah. Yes? I... Oh, I here's your father now. Well, oh, Rebecca, is this right? Is it fair to leave our happiness to the decision of someone else? I... I care for you deeply. Well, that's what I wanted to say to you, Noah. Now, before Papa comes, I'll have to do whatever the elders have decided. And perhaps it is right that I should marry the Major, but I, I love you. Oh, Rebecca. Oh, oh, good evening, Mr. Webster. Good evening, Mr. Party. Rebecca? Papa, tell us. Mr. Webster understands our position. I've just told him, Father. Oh, please. The elders have given the matter much consideration, Mr. Webster. And their decision? Their decision is that it's Rebecca's duty to marry the Major. Oh. Oh. My best wishes to you and the Major, Miss Party. Mr. Webster, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Will you give him my congratulations? And if I don't see you again, will you know that I shall never cease to wish for your happiness? Not see me again. I'm leaving Sharon immediately. Leaving? Giving up your school? Oh, come now, Mr. Webster. You'll get over this. Yes, I... I shall get over it. But that doesn't make the pain any less now. Webster left Sharon and buried himself in his work. In those days, education was in demand by our rapidly expanding country. Webster became more and more conscious of the need for a system adapted to the needs of a new nation. In 1782, he made his first contribution. The scene is a study of Dr. Ezra Stiles of Yale College. And so, Dr. Stiles, I've brought the manuscript of my spelling book to you, with the comments of those who have examined it at Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania. Now, let me understand you, Mr. Webster. This speller is to be the first of a series of textbooks which you hope will revolutionize American education. Is that it? I hope it will be the basis for a complete new system of education in this country, Mr. Style. The one we have now scarcely can be called American. Our textbooks originate in England. Our history, our geography, our public sentiments, are all British. Yes, that unfortunately is true. I expect to follow this speller with a grammar, then a reader, Dr. Stiles. My hope is to accomplish three things. To simplify and unify our language, lay down a common rule of spelling and pronunciation, and to promote a spirit of patriotism. Well, young man, isn't that a rather extensive program? Perhaps. But as you say, I am a young man. America must be as independent in literature as she is in politics. And it's not impossible that a man of my youth may have some influence in arousing a literary spirit in our country. I'm very much interested in this, Mr. Webster. 
Indeed, I see in this book of yours a far-reaching force. But I fear you've approached it with too much timidity. The American instructor is too modest a title for such a book. Well, what would you suggest, sir? Well, I suggest that you call it a grammatical institute of the English language. I'm afraid I should be considered presumptuous. Assuredly, you will be considered presumptuous. You will be attacked from all sides. But your purpose is worthy of the battle. But, Dr. Stiles, you're proposing that I... that I set myself up as an absolute authority. I'm proposing more than that, Mr. Webster. I'm proposing that you become the lawgiver in language here in America. Noah Webster's Grammatical Institute, in spite of attack and ridicule, gained immediate popularity. But Webster had sold his royalty rights for a few hundred dollars and was as poor as ever. He traveled to the country preaching his doctrine of nationalism and in Boston found a second Rebecca, a gay and charming girl. After an understanding, which lasted more than two years, he married Rebecca Greenleaf and settled in Hartford. The day following their marriage, they go to inspect their new home. My dear, I marvel at your ability. When I realize that you have furnished a house completely, furniture, china, looking glasses, and bought your wardrobe, all from the wedding check which your brother James gave us, I'm amazed. We start our married life comfortably and free from debt. Well, Noah, I... Why, Becca, the furniture for the parlor hasn't arrived. That's strange. Well, no, I, I must tell you. Well, the other things all seem to be here. Sitting and dining room are in order. And, uh, my Becca, nothing has come for the kitchen. No, please come here and listen to me. I meant to tell you before, but I was afraid you'd scold me. Well, what's the matter, Becca? Couldn't the store fill the order? It was ample time. It wasn't that, no. It was that well, when I came to pay for the thing, I'd spent all the money. Spent all the money? What? I gave you a whole thousand dollars. I know. But the chins were so lovely, and I didn't know it would cost so much. Oh, no, I'm afraid I'm a very bad manager. Becca, do you mean that you didn't plan? That you just went ahead and ordered all these things without figuring out the cost? Oh, well, I'm afraid so. Oh, no, please don't look like that. I can't help it. I'd counted on that money to cover all our expenses. Becca, how much are you short? Well, the money's all gone. I haven't paid for any of my clothes, even my wedding dress. And there's no furniture for the father and no carpet. Oh, no. I haven't bought a single thing for the kitchen. And so Noah Webster started his family life under the financial cloud which seemed always to hang over him. But he adored his wife, who was always light-hearted in spite of his serious-minded attitude. In 1793, he moved his family to New York and became editor of the American Minerva. His editorial views met with violent opposition. In May 1800, he is in the office of the magazine in conversation with his editor, Samuel Bayer. I don't understand it, Bayer. I've been honest in my policies, frank in my opinions. What is my fault? Why am I the object of all this conflict? Well, perhaps you've been too honest, too frank. A man who has not said all has less to retract, you know, when the opposition is in power. Yet I, I've only sought to point out... Where they were wrong. No man can do that and be loved, Mr. Webster. But I've only wanted to be a prompter. A man who sits behind the scenes to help the actor when he forgets. A prompter does very little, but that little is necessary and does much good. I've wanted to show the vice and the folly. You have done that at every point, Mr. Webster. It has not been without effect. You have many admirers. 
You have also many enemies. Why? Why, when I am only trying to do good, why should they hate me so? Human nature hates correction. Eh, uh, I suppose so. Well, then, I must fortify myself for the greatest hatred I have ever faced. For I am about to undertake wholesale correction. Well, what are you going to do now? Finish the work of which I have dreamed for years. I am about to compile a complete dictionary, Bayard. I am about to record the American language. Noah Webster had set aside a period of five years in which to complete his dictionary. But he soon realized that it was an undertaking to which he might well dedicate the remainder of his life. He was determined to include all words in what he called the living English language. By 1813, he had mastered 20 languages. Slowly, painstakingly, hour after hour, year after year, he collected his material. Late one night, his wife tiptoes into his study. No, my dear. Can't you stop now? Presently, presently. It's growing late. Yes, I know, I know. Becca, it's very strange. A root word in 20 languages remains the same. Only see, see how the consonants change. S, P, and look here. Noah, you've been working since early this morning. You must It proves, Becca. It proves. And it can be traced. In English, it becomes... You aren't even listening to me. You'll make yourself ill, Noah. The doctor tells uh, Send me the French dictionary, will you, dear? It goes on and You'll on. You'll have another heart attack. Please listen to me. I, of course, my dear, of course. I, I am listening to you. You were saying... You were saying that... Uh, no. In the last Noah, minute... it's three o'clock and the fire is out. You must stop. What? What is it, dear? You're going to stop work. Now. Very well. Very well. Why didn't you tell me it was growing late? Tell you? Oh, my dear... Your eyes are inflamed again. Oh, they're only tired. This is close study. Oh, Becca. Becca. All this must be very wearisome to you. And I'm sorry. But whatever should I do without you? was 70 years old when in 1828 he returned for months of patient research abroad and took up his usual routine again in his study in New Haven. In the next room, Mrs. Webster talks with a group of neighbors. I'm sorry that I can't disturb him, but it is a rule even on his first day at home. Well, we only came to bid him welcome. We hear his dictionary is almost finished. Yes, it is nearing completion, but he's still working. Well, Mrs. Webster... We planned a little celebration in honor of Mr. Webster's return. Some of the professors are coming over from Yale and quite a lot of the townsfolk. And I took the liberty of writing your daughters and they'll all be here most any time now. Why, that is a surprise. We want Mr. Webster to know that, that New Haven's proud of him. We think he's doing a fine thing in writing this dictionary. A thing folks will remember and be grateful for. Oh, but... There'll be people here to tell him better than I can, but when can we see him, Mrs. Webster? Well, I usually go in and interrupt him about four o'clock, take him some fruit or cake. Well, it's most four now, and folks will be coming soon. Well, I'll go in and sort of pave the way. Noah? Noah? Oh, Becca, my dear. Are you busy, Noah? No, I'm not busy any longer. Becca, I've just written the last word. You... you've actually finished? The dictionary is complete. No. Twenty-eight years. Oh, my dear. It's been a long time. Uh, some of your friends are outside, Noah. They know that you've returned. Oh, why didn't you tell me before? 
Well, I didn't like to disturb you when you were at work. Mm. Faithful Rebecca. Our work is done now. And I owe much to you. Our prayers have been answered that we might be spared to do this work. God has been good to us, Becca. Here, give me your hand. Let us give thanks together. Amen. Amen. And now, our friends, Rebecca, ask them to come in. Webster lived to be a patriarch of 85. The storm which centered about his textbooks and his dictionary died away, and his American version of the Bible occupied his old age. He died May 28, 1843, but he lives in the memory of America as both teacher and preacher. DuPont is proud to salute him tonight as a nation's schoolmaster in the cavalcade of America. <laughs> Vast changes have taken place since Noah Webster's time. We live in different kinds of homes from those of just a few years ago, wear clothes made of new materials, eat different kinds of foods, move about in new types of conveyances. Many of these changes have been brought about through chemistry. From research laboratories, such as those maintained by the DuPont Company, comes a stream of new and better products to add to our comfort, convenience, and welfare. The DuPont Company's annual report recently released shows in a striking way just how fast things are changing. The report pointed out that 12 lines of products developed or improved during the past 10 years now represent about 40% of DuPont's annual sales. These 12 groups of products alone, ranging from Dulux finishes through camphor, dyes, rayon, and chloroprene rubber, last year provided jobs for 18,000 workers or 7,300 more than were employed on the same groups in 1928. Recognizing people's keen interest in information about this fast-changing wonder world of chemistry, the editors of Popular Mechanics magazine have just been running a series of illustrated articles containing some unusual stories of chemistry. Much of the information they contain is so fresh and new, it's not yet to be found even in the encyclopedia. Many listeners to the Cavalcade of America have asked for additional information on the brief stories of chemistry given on these programs. Therefore, we've secured permission to have these Popular Mechanics magazine articles reprinted in the form of a 32-page booklet, especially for our Cavalcade audience. This booklet is called Chemistry and You, and you may secure a copy simply by writing DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware. Do you know the story behind the long struggle to produce a man-made product better than the rubber from nature's rubber trees? Or how an astonishing new healing agent for wounds was discovered? These stories and others are told in this booklet, Chemistry and You, illustrated with more than 50 pictures, many of them in full color. It's a fascinating story, told in an easy-to-understand way. Just address DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware and ask for the free booklet, Chemistry and You. Of course, if you care to comment on these Cavalcade of America programs, which we are trying to make more interesting each week, we will welcome that, too. The story of one of the most remarkable women of our time, Anne Sullivan Macy, and how she taught Helen Keller a method of communication with the outside world will be the subject of our broadcast when next week at the same time, DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>